Good afternoon, folks. As people are populating in here, um, just welcome, welcome, welcome to the Adopt US Kids webinar that we're doing this afternoon. I really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to, to be with us today. I know everybody's really busy. So um, the fact that you guys come in and uh, share with us your experiences and your expertise and come and learn with us, we really, really appreciate it. And um, as people are coming in, um, it, how's everybody's fall doing so far? I know it isn't quite fall, but some people are getting to experience a little bit of fall. I'm in the South. And so I have right now simultaneously leaves falling and mosquitoes, which like seems really unfair. <laughs> and unfair. Um, Cause I would like, if I'm gonna have to experience cold weather, which is fine, I just don't want the bugs. I want the bugs to go away. What's it like in Vermont, Kim? So up in my little mountainous area of Vermont, we have officially begun fall. Yesterday, we had a torrential wind and rainstorm that broke an umbrella off of my deck, ripped it right out of the bolts. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's important to have exciting things happen. Yeah. You know, it keeps us on our toes. Um, so with that, I hope y'all's umbrellas are not broken. Um, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so again, thank you guys for, um, joining us today. Um, today's webinar is an Adopt US Kids webinar, and we are going to be discussing, uh, how we're discussing racial identity and support groups. My name is Britt Cloudsdale. I'm the Adopt US Kids Family Support Program Manager, and I am so, so grateful, um, to be introducing our presenters today who are Nathan Ross and Kim Stevens. Nathan and Ross are going to be introducing themselves, uh, more concretely in a little bit, but they are both child welfare professionals and they both have lived experience in transracial adoption. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a minute. But before that, I am going to go ahead and get us started with a little bit of housekeeping um, to keep us moving forward here. Um, so this webinar is being recorded. Um, a lot of folks um, wanted to make sure that this webinar is being recorded because I know folks are very, very busy. And so it's totally fine if you have to pop off, pop back in. You won't miss anything. Um, and everybody who has registered for the webinar will get a copy um, and a link to the recording. And the recording is also going to be posted publicly publicly on the Adopt Use Kids website for professionals, okay? So I'm going to make sure everybody has that link. Everything's going to be okie dokie artichokey. Um, and uh, we also, when you're uh, getting the email that comes um, with the link to the recording, you're also going to get a um, certificate of attendance if you did attend live. So that's kind of an FAQ that we often get from folks. If you are attending live right now, you can get a certificate. So just to address that. Um, and your lines are going to be muted throughout this conversation today, which I know, um, you know, we hope that you do engage with us as much as you can though, right? We're actually gonna be using um, a, a tool that is um, not new, but it's new to us, um, but we're gonna be using Mentimeter um, and we are going to be um, sharing a link with you guys um, so that you guys can participate um, both in a poll and in some engagement questions that you're gonna be able to provide anonymous um, comments to or responses to so that you don't, um, if you're worried about um, saying something and tying your name to it or anything like that, you can respond anonymously via Mentimeter. So if you have any trouble with that. We can also try and help you with that in the um, in the chat box. If you have any technical issues, please do um, write in chat, which is in the um, Zoom control panel. And if you have questions, which we hope you do um, for our uh, lovely panelists, um, please put those in the Q&A pod, which is also in your Zoom control panel. So, um, and then we also um, are going to be sending you guys right after this webinar closes, we're going to be sending you an email from Adopt US Kids Evaluation, and that has a survey in it. And we really, really hope that you'll take five minutes to respond to that survey. We really, really value um, all of the feedback that we get from you guys. It, um, it really helps us plan for our future content and other training opportunities, other resources. And we really want to make sure that what we're delivering to y'all is what you actually need. So if this this does meet your needs and you want more, or if it doesn't, this wasn't right, and you want something different, please respond. Please let us know. We really, really do use it. We use those, um, uh, the feedback we get all the time for future planning. So we'll hope you do that. Um, and again, before we get started, um, I just very briefly do want to share um, what Adopt Use Kids is for those who are less familiar. Um, Adopt Use Kids is a national project of the U.S. Children's Bureau, and we have a two pronged mission. The first part of our mission is to raise public awareness about the need for foster and adoptive families for children in the public child welfare system. Uh, but the second part of our mission, maybe the less well-known part of that mission, um, is to, we also assist U.S. states, territories, and tribes in the recruitment, engagement, development, and support of foster, adoptive, and kinship families, right? And so this webinar that we're doing today is in service of the second part of that mission. 
Um, we have a national ad campaign uh, with PSAs that you may have seen on TV or on social media that encourage folks to consider adopting teens from foster care. Um, and we also have a national photo listing with over 5,000 uh, children and teens that are in need of permanent homes where um, they can be matched with um, home studied families. And we also have a, a foster care and adoption response system where we have folks that are ready to answer chat and calls um, from interested families, answer their questions and keep them engaged and get them um, connected with the appropriate jurisdiction so that they can then go on to foster and adopt. Um, we also have a capacity building and engagement team, and this team actually provides the um, system specific assistance, which is always a really fun phrase to say, but they can provide um, consultation to you. So if, you're, if your jurisdiction is in need, um, uh, has a specific need related to anything that's in um, our scope of work, um, we'd be happy to talk with you about how Adoptive Kids might be able to help you. And I have resources on how to do that at the end of this um, webinar. Um, we also have a family support team, which is what me and uh, Kim and Nathan are a part of. And the family support team, we help um, with trainings like this and other resources to help jurisdictions um, implement or improve and prioritize the support of adoptive foster and kinship families. And that also includes resources for parent group leaders. This webinar is for parent group leaders. And the resource that we're sharing with you today is also for parent group leaders. So that is something that I wanted to make sure folks know. We actually have a litany of resources for that specific audience, for parent group leaders. Um, and I'm happy to provide you with links to a lot of different things today. So um, let's, with that, I'm going to move us ahead and start talking about this webinar specifically. Um, so goals for this webinar. This webinar, as I said, is primarily for parent support group leaders, okay? So the, or also those that are, um, are from agencies or leading programs that have a support group component, but primarily for those that are actually doing the leading of support groups. So um, that's who we're talking to today, right? And that doesn't mean that you won't gain anything if you yourself are not leading a support group, if you're just a, a participant, or if you're um, a person who is raising a child of color and, um, and raising a child transracially, um, or if you're a child welfare professional, you're, I, I would expect that you would still get something from this conversation, but I just wanted to make sure that folks were clear on kind of who we're talking to today um, so that, um, you know, I still think you would come away with some really important takeaways, but just so that everybody is clear on that. Um, and um, this webinar is, is also one of the ways that we are introducing a brand new resource to y'all. Um, if you um, uh, registered you should have gotten an email from me today that included a resource on um, a, a discussion guide rather to help you navigate these conversations, um, specifically with white parents who are parenting children of color to help them really promote and prioritize their children's positive racial identity. So um, Kim and Nathan are going to be um, kind of helping set the stage for these conversations. And of course, we can't go over everything that's in that discussion guide in 90 minutes. That's not possible. So here's what we aim to do today. Um, we are going to be discussing the um, importance of approaching these discussions of race in support groups with intentionality, right? That, that you come to those conversations prepared and anticipating what you and the group may experience. Um, and we also want to highlight some, some critical elements of that discussion on race and racism, things that that you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you include things that you should not skip or speed through, right? Some important components. Um, and then primarily, primarily what we're gonna do is uh, give you some concrete strategies to kind of help you navigate these discussions effectively and including how to navigate maybe some resistance to these discussions and other hard feelings that kind of tend to pop up during these conversations on race. Um, so um, with that, I do wanna um, get us moving forward here. Um, I wanted to make sure that folks understood that kind of what we're not going to be discussing today as well. Uh, Adopt Use Kids does have many resources to help parent group leaders, as I mentioned. Um, so if you need support on um, maybe more like foundational uh, uh, facilitation skills, we do have resources like that. And I'll make sure folks um, get the link to where all these things are located. But we're not going to today, um, Kim and Nathan are not going to be talking about kind of like the more foundational basic facilitation skills. We're going to kind of assume that folks know how to lead a group um, and know the basics of facilitation. Um, and we're also not going to go into in depth anyway, um, any sort of like basic understanding of what systemic racism looks like nationally, and also especially what systemic racism looks like in child welfare. We kind of expect everybody here to understand that um, uh, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx children are um, historically and systemically overrepresented in child welfare, um, and that black and brown families are um, uh, routinely engaging with the child welfare system um, more than their white counterparts. And that as a result, black and brown children are um, uh, 
end up uh, being raised either temporarily or permanently by white families uh, much, much more often. And so this conversation is really specific. It is a very specific conversation. So be, even though it is very important for all children to have positive racial identity, and we also definitely acknowledge that um, families of color are also parenting transracially, right? You could absolutely, and we see it all the time, have black families parenting white children, um, Latinx families parenting black children. Those are also all transracial, transcultural um, um, uh, placements, uh, families, relationships, right? But this, it, specific conversation is really about um, helping white parents prioritize and promote their racial, um, the positive racial identity for their children of color, because we know that black and brown children, specifically black, Latinx, and indigenous children are overrepresented in our child welfare system and our foster care system, and they do end up very frequently being raised by white families, and so we need to make sure that we are um, having these conversations with families um, for the benefit of those children that are in those placements. So I just wanted to get real specific. So like, what are we talking about here? So that's what we're gonna do. Um, and we also do expect that everybody is sitting in here that you all have a basic understanding that children of color have a right to their cultures of origin and that their well-being is inherently tied to positive racial identity. Obviously, these are like really big conversations that we're having today. We're kind of just we're, we're trying to take a bite out of it. Right. We're trying to get kind of get you started, get you oriented to the right um, in the right way, right, to get to start these conversations. So there's never going to be a time where we're going to tackle all of it, where we're going to make sure that we talked about everything that you're ever going to consider as you consider these really big conversations with your support groups. So that's just kind of some level setting um, to get us started. Um, and so before I hand it over to Kim and Nathan, I know y'all are tired of hearing me talk. Um, I, we're going to do something that Kim taught me. Um, and that is, what is it called? A waterfall, Kim? A waterfall response, a ca cascade response. Um, so I would love, what we're going to do, you guys have a prompt. And that is, what are you hoping to get out of today's session? But before you go ahead and type and hit enter, before you put it in there, we're going to type it in and we're going to wait. We're going to wait until I say, go ahead and hit enter. And the, what that does for those that are doing virtual support groups, especially, it can help kind of make sure that um, those that are first to respond or those that are more likely to respond, that their voices aren't the only voices that we hear. And it also helps <laughs> prevent people from be like, um, uh, oh, I'm the only one that it, I'm, I'm not seeing anything that looks like what I'm about to say. So I'm just not going to say it or, oh, it's already been said. I'm not going to worry about saying it, you know, because you're seeing responses come in through the chat. So this technique, that's kind of what it does. And I really, really like it. So I'm gonna give folks a second to think about what are you hoping to get out of this session today? I'm gonna to give you a second to type. And in three seconds, we're gonna go ahead and hit enter. So three, two, one, hit enter for me. Oh, and then it becomes a cascade. And so we get so many awesome responses to that. So what do we have? Thank you, God. Oh, and that's what's so fun is we get them all at the same time. Um, so general information, uh, be a better trainer, awesome. Um, ability to train new foster parents, hoping to learn how to navigate difficult conversations for potential adoptive parents, that's great. Um, how to have these conversations with my own family, great, 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 great. I love it. There's a bunch in there. I'm sure we're going to get to um, all of them. Kim and Nathan, look behind me because I can't keep up. Um, the other thing I wanted to make sure folks knew is that this webinar is the first conversation in a set of conversations. We are going to have a peer meeting on September 27th, and I'm going to put the link to that in the chat in just a minute. But we um, have a peer meeting scheduled for September 27th, and it's at three o'clock Eastern. And we hope you register for that because <laughs> though you guys can't chat back and forth with Nathan and Kim here, we hope to do that during um, the peer meeting where we are um, gonna just have like a regular meeting where you guys can talk back and forth. We're gonna do whatever the needs are of that group. Um, we will try and meet them. And it's really an opportunity for you guys to talk with peers about what is and is not working as you try to have these conversations in your in your support groups. So it's an opportunity to really get in there and um, continue the conversation essentially. So with that, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be quiet and I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan now. Thanks. Thanks, Britt. Uh, so we'll do some quick introductions and then we'll get into more of the content. So I, I'm Nathan Ross. I am a project specialist with the North American Council on Adoptable Children. Um, and I have the opportunity to also work with Adopt US Kids working with Britt on different projects, um, this being one of them. Professionally, I've worked in child welfare for 
a little over 10 years now, um, have shared my story as an adopted person. Longer than that, I was transracially adopted as a teen. And so being able to combine both of those experiences has been very helpful, not only for my continued learning, but also being able to give back to the system and talk to others about the things that went well for me and my journey and identity um, and things that would have been more helpful. Uh, we'll talk again through throughout this presentation about some topic areas that are important. And one of the things that registered for me as I started this journey was really recognizing that a lot of my things that my parents did went really well, but a lot of my identity journey came into when I was an adult. And so there were some opportunities for things that could have helped pave the way a little sooner for me um, when I was a, a teenager, recognizing that I was only with my adoptive parents for five years before I went off to college. So just navigating the complexity of it, you know, you can't know everything. And sometimes, um, you know, you wish that you had known more and been able to do more. And so we're hoping that we're able to provide some of that perspective for those of you who are leading support groups, but also as we saw in the comments, parenting now so that you can integrate that in um, as your children get it, you know, move eventually into adulthood. So then I'll turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Kim Stevens here, and I also work at the North American Council on Adoptable Children when I'm not partnering with Brit on Adopt US Kids um, projects. I've been with NACAC since 1997, first as a board member and then as a staff member and am an adoptive parent. My husband and I have six children. Two of them are birth kids, four of them are adopted and three of those adopted children are African-American. Um, I think one of, th there's two things that for me um, really bring me to this work in a strong way. One is, knowing how important it was going to be for my children to be able to have role models and to have access to their families of origin, to their community, to everything imaginable that was going to help them to become the incredible adults that they are. Um, it's hard enough to enter the foster care system. It's hard enough to lose your family. But when you layer into that, that you now have also lost your, your culture and you've lost your community, it makes it ever so much more difficult. So it, it's been a very important journey for our family to take, um, to partner with other families of color, to partner with people that can help us do a better job. But the other thing that I have um, really been struck by in, in a deeply emotional and deeply personal way is the knowledge that I gained when I was finally able to meet the parents of my three African-American children, their moms in particular, and, and to think about the systemic issues behind the fact that they lost their children for reasons that so many other um, families that look like me, white families, have been able to continue to parent their children. So it's very multidimensional for me, and I think it's an incredibly important conversation. Um, and so I also have to say I'm deeply grateful to Adopt US Kids for providing us with the opportunity to help contribute to the guide and then also to take this conversation out into the community. So I think we're gonna. Okay. So um, as we as we start off, and you know, as Britt mentioned, though we're not able to have you all go off camera and talk to us, in, you know, in some of the ways we're used to, this is a fairly interactive presentation that we're doing today, especially in the beginning. So we'll, we're, you know, we appreciate all of you taking the time to respond to these polls, and we'll try to keep them um, as brief as possible while expanding on the the results. So with with this first one, what we're interested in knowing is, has your support group had discussions about race and racism? Um, so if you would, again, access that Mentimeter information and start plugging in your answer for us, and we'll be able to then um, to talk through that. So I see that there's some people who are responding between a few times and many times. Okay, and I also see in the chat, thank you, um, Shannon. Yes, we host a transracial group specifically for white parents. Um, Sheila is saying a few times, so okay. Thank you, thank you for everyone. And, and again, you know, while we have Mentimeter, I, we are gonna look at this chat box as well. So if it's more convenient or easier to put it, put it in there, that's perfectly okay. Um, we have a group for parents of color, global majority. Oh, I like the global majority piece, thank you. Okay, so we're seeing it looks like a, a variety of answers, mostly getting into the a few times or many times. 
So, so that's good. We also have some people here who are saying that they've never or only once. And so I think that that's, you know, it's really important and it makes the conversations more fruitful when we have that range of um, experience and expertise. And I think as you get done with this presentation, as we get into the guide, we'll also see, you know, as you look through the guide later on, that it is helpful for helping to, you know, groups get up to speed or to enhance knowledge from things you already talked about. Um, so I don't know if we want to give it a few more minutes or if we want to move on to the next one, but I think we have a good, good idea of this one. All right, cool. So we've talked about, have you had the conversations? Now our question is, what has helped you have the conversations about race and racism in support groups? Um, so I think that, you know, again, identifying what's important here. So if you will. So previous training, I'm seeing a response there for that. Honesty, yes, absolutely. And honesty can be really hard, you know, because some people kind of go over and they, you know, feel like bluntness is honesty and that can be disengaging for some people. So having that right balance of being vulnerable, being transparent without coming across as um, cold. Practice, yes. See a safe space, safe space. Yes, as we, as we uh, ran through this earlier, that was one of the pieces that we put in there as well transparency. And the, the great thing about this, you know, what we're putting in here and what I'm seeing in responses is also very much what we're seeing as we start thinking about how do we have these conversations with our children and our young people, you know, these pieces that help make this conversation help um, easier for us or supportive also translate in some of these aspects with um, guiding those conversations for, for our, our children. I want to add Nathan in the chat box. I see that Elizabeth, um, who has adopted both Hispanic and African American kids, that the kids themselves have been really open and able to give feedback, which I know for myself, I learned so much from my children on a number of topics. Um, it is it is a really great way to understand where they are and how they're feeling. Thank you. Lots of great answers. Yes. And so, of course, that follow-up question is always, what's made it harder to have those conversations in your support groups? And we'll give you some time to answer. Um, I'm curious, ignorance about the topic or ignorance that it, it's not something that affects their family? Because there, there can be both, right? Right. That fear of offending people is huge. And, and again, you have the different experience levels, right? The people that have less experience can oftentimes feel really insecure and uncomfortable. Right, absolutely. Our own pain, absolutely. I, I, I also, the not having personal experience, that can be very difficult. You know, how do you try to walk people through something that you don't feel like you have a direct story about can be, um, mm -hmm. can be difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see offendings in here a couple of times and in various ways. And I think that that's, yeah. it, it, that is a very common problem that we see anytime we have these discussions is, you know, and, and as a transracially adopted person, anytime I've engaged in these conversations, I know one of the pieces that people tell me is helpful is feeling like they can ask questions, not questions that are insensitive, but that they don't have to have that worry about, I, I wonder about this, I have a question about it, but is this even appropriate to ask about. And so that can mm -hmm. be challenging for people. You want to learn, but you don't know how you go about learning without potentially making someone offended or feeling stupid. You know, no one wants to look like, you know, they're ignorant. No one wants to look like they don't know anything. And so that can be challenging as well as getting past the, um, any type of the shame or guilt that people might feel. I, I appreciate whoever put in the Mentimeter people who don't see color. I know that, um, so our first adoption happened in 1988, and way back then, I know a lot of families were being instructed that love is enough, right? That don't don't focus on the differences. Um, but yet, what I've heard from my own children and from other people's children, adult children and younger, if you don't see color, then you don't see me, right? And how mm -hmm. how good it is that we're moving away from that for sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. 
Okay. Nathan, okay. take it away. So we're setting the stage for these complex conversations. I, I think one, one of the pieces that we have to be um, knowledgeable of first is understanding where our own work has happened. And so I think as we, as you all are looking through this and we have people at various experiences and all that part, making sure that we've done our work and have ourselves in a position where we can be non-judgmental, you know, facilitators um, for this critical dialogue. So that, you know, that's always the uh, piece that we want to start out with. And, and again, it's acknowledging where, where are my gaps in knowledge? You know, what are the things that I feel like I'm confident on and that I have an understanding on? Do I have a good foundation for uh, institutional systemic racism, specifically in child welfare? Do I understand that piece? Do I understand the various ways that culture impact uh, identity formation? Do I have an understanding of the, you know, for children, we've talked about, you know, we're going to talk today about identity, especially as, you know, it comes to race and culture, but how does that intersect with trauma and mental health and other just adoption or foster care identity and the complex things that are going on. Because we know for people, especially for our children, it's not just one category and then they move on to the next. They're dealing with all of these things together. And as parents and as parent group leaders, we're trying to help navigate all of these situations. Um, so how so figuring out where where does your knowledge on those pieces and how are you going to help move the conversations forward is of course um, extremely important. Uh, the other thing we have to, you know, allow these conversations to happen over time and building on gains. It can feel like because we know this work is so critical, we know these conversations are so critical, we could be tempted to want to get all of this in within a meeting or two, you know, or let's, you know, try to knock this out in a, a few weeks because we want parents to, and as parents, you want to be able to start implementing what you learn with your children. But what we also know is that these are deep conversations that really take time to reflect and figure out how you're going to incorporate into what you're doing, again, as a professional and or a parent. And so we have to make sure that we're breaking these up and not trying to rush the process and then being okay with saying, we talked about this subject and we thought we were going to be able to move past it in this timeline, but it looks like we need to spend more time. We need to do a deeper dive in terms of either knowledge or feelings around the knowledge, and that's okay, um, because that's how we're going to see the long-term gains <laughs> versus just saying everyone get on board, and if you don't get on board, you kind of, you know, leave the process. So making sure that we're okay with the, setting that stage appropriately for this complex ongoing conversation. Um, we have to acknowledge the potential burden on people of color. And so if you have parent groups where you have uh, people who are white and people of color in the groups together, it can sometimes, because we are you know, so interested in learning, for our white counterparts, it can feel like the best thing to do is to ask the people of color in the room to lend them their expertise to answer all of these questions. And while there's definitely merit in that, and you'll see what can feel like a contradictory answer later on as we talk about making sure to use, you know, peers and people with lived experience, we have to also acknowledge that it, it can feel like a burden for people of color when everyone is constantly coming to them, expecting them to be the expert, expecting them to put themselves on the line and talk about very vulnerable real pieces over and over again. And so as we saw in the men's meter, someone put personal pain around the subject. And so we have to just be, we have to be conscious of, are we asking for permission? Do we know that these individuals want to be um, experts or want to lend their, their knowledge and their personal experiences? And are we making sure that at the end of the day, we are still doing our work to better um, equip ourselves with knowledge. And so looking at other sources, not just those in our groups. So making sure that we are being very cognizant of that. We are not saying by any means that you should exclude people of color from this conversation and just have a, a whites only um, parent group discussion over this. We are saying, make sure that when we are doing this, that we are intentional about why are we asking the questions and we aren't expecting them to solve all of the problems for everyone in the group. Okay, um, we, we also need to set ground rules. We have to maintain a safe space. I saw that in a couple of the posts, um, again, at Mentimeter. It's crucial for this conversation. The fastest way to disengage your group is to have people have a response that's genuine or from a lack of knowledge and be shut down in a way that makes them feel like they've been shamed or blamed. 
And so we have to just be very transparent as we start these conversations of what are our ground rules? What is it going to be okay for us to talk about? How do we challenge or call in to people so that we're making sure that we're saying, okay, can you explain more about this? Or, you know, I have a different opinion and explaining why without trying to shut people down or making them feel again, like they're, they're um, ignorant. So we also have to be okay with getting, being uncomfortable. And then even as a person of color, it is uncomfortable to have these conversations of race and racism. And it's, you know, and I'm a person who wants this to get better in the world. I want to see a world where I don't have to feel worried walking down the street or anytime I go into a new space, wondering what people are going to assess about me with, with by just looking at me. And so even though I want that, it still it feels easier to shy away from it and go for the let's all play nice and just not acknowledge things. And so I have to also challenge myself on being uncomfortable sometimes. And so as, as we are working with um, white parents and white parent support group leaders, we have to make sure that we're understanding that piece as well um, and being okay with being uncomfortable and saying, we're gonna lean into it and we're gonna all get through this together. And then let's prepare for success. Uh, so what mindset best supports engaging in this conversation? Again, it can feel like, oh my gosh, we're talking about really heavy topics and it's, it seems doom and gloom. But we also acknowledge the reason why we talk about this is because there is beauty in difference. And so we, we kind of have a culture where we try to think everyone should be the same and treat everyone the same as if that's appropriate. When it, whereas we're really saying, let's shift it to acknowledging the beauty and the appropriateness of difference. Um, we're, we're not going to use difference to belittle people, to take um, resources away from people, but instead to uplift and to embrace that and to help us learn and expand our knowledge. And so how are we shifting our mindsets to prepare for success and to honor all of the pieces that come from this conversation? Kim, I don't know if there's anything additional that you wanted to add to that. I think you covered it beautifully. Okay. <clears throat> And so, of course, you know, that starts with we have to acknowledge racism. And it seems obvious, I would hope, I guess, for people who are on this call that, you know, we have to acknowledge racism, but that's, it's very multifaceted. And so sometimes we think about racism as a very, very broad experience where we're talking about, oh, we understand that racism exists, but we don't think in our backyard. You know, it, it gets a little easier to say, oh, out there, that is an issue, but we have it together. And so we really have to make sure as we're facilitating these conversations, and as we're thinking about what's the best way to approach this, that we start by acknowledge, acknowledging that racism exists. It's still a, a thing, and it's a thing in our communities. Um, and we can go as small as we want to in those communities. It could be within our family, our friend groups, um, our you know different social connections. So we have to acknowledge that and be prepared to say it. And it doesn't mean to say you are racist and actively working to oppress people of color. And so that's, you know, people kind of get to the extreme. Well, I do X, Y, Z that makes me not racist. And so we have to start breaking that piece down. We have to acknowledge the ways in which our culture the way that we're socialized as individuals has reinforced race, racist practices through time so that they've become ingrained as just practices. We don't even realize, recognize the ways that we are perpetuating. Even again, for people of color, we have to look at, oh, wow, these are things that we've just learned as being part of the, the general cultural soup that are actually perpetuating racism within our own communities. And so we have to have those very, again, tough but necessary conversations um, in order to really make progress through this. So we have to anticipate participants' desire to distance themselves, as I said, um, <clears throat> and we need to access resources to expand our understanding. And you'll see throughout the guide uh, that there are different resources and links to um, engaging in this work. One of the great things that's happened over the last few years, and of course, you know, anti-racist work has been going on for a long time, but we've really seen a boom over the last few years. And so we're also seeing a boom in those resources and connections for people in all different learning styles, because that's also super important. You know, it might be that books work for you, but others it's podcasts and videos. And so we're able to find those different resources to help people connect. And I think that that's gonna be extremely important we know it's extremely important because if we want this to be ongoing work, it has to be, um, people have to be able to get the information in a way that best meets their learning ability. Uh, we have to connect with what we believe we know about historical roots of racism. And so again, that's also in my own journey, you know, I had, again, a very general knowledge or what I thought the history of racism was. And as I continue to do this work and continue to just reflect 
for my own identity journey, learning more about, oh, wow, I didn't realize these practices lead to the perpetual reason why it's harder for Black individuals to maintain high positions in agencies or um, companies, you know, and so having to understand all of those pieces, we have to come come together and connect on what we believe we know and finding additional information um, to either support that or to, again, broaden our horizons and so that we're better equipped to help facilitate these conversations within our groups and to challenge each other appropriately and in a healthy um, way. Ken, is there any more that? The only thing that I would add to that, Nathan, is, um, and, and I've, I've had this pushback myself when I've had conversations with friends and neighbors and just random people, this um, oftentimes belief, especially from white people that Racism is all about like white nationalism, white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, lynching. It's all about the extreme violence and the extreme hatred. And one of the things that we really have to come to embrace and understand is that racism is not always intentional or violent, but it's, it's um, as somebody I really respect describes it, it's part of the water we all swim in together. Mm -hmm. So it's also subtle things, right? And um, I, I often think about people that will say, I'm the least racist person that you know. Well, I've never met the least racist person that I know. So just giving ourselves permission to realize that we oftentimes will say or do or think things that really do fall under the umbrella of racism, even when it's not an intention. It's mm -hmm. sort of a default. And as Quincy said, it can also just be about indifference, right? If we're not, if we're not actively being anti-racist, um, then in, in a lot of the books that I've read, we really should be acknowledging that that means that we are still part of the racist sort mm -hmm. of system, right? Yeah, and it's helping people understand, you know, because racist, it, it has, it's such a charged word mm -hmm. it makes people think you know again as you were saying you know kkk and all of these very extreme things but it's really helping people think that the way that we make decisions mm -hmm. are impacted some of those ways are impacted by what we see by our understanding of black brown indigenous people and so really and it takes a deep dive you know and mm -hmm. so we we don't realize again the unconscious connections that we just make Right. Good or bad, you know, and so I, as I, you know, some of the articles you read for Asian cultures and just the assumption that, oh, if you see an Asian person, they're going to be really smart, you know, mm -hmm. and so and talk and, you know, having the Asian authors talking about how that is a form of perpetual racism as well mm -hmm. and puts undue burden. So your assumption based on looks, uh, you know, is that someone has a set of skills or lacks a set of skills or is going to act in a certain way or not act in a certain way. Yeah. And so those are the ways in which we perpetuate racism, even on subtle micro levels that we really have to think about. And again, mostly they, they become unintentional because it's just the way our society has reinforced it through our media, through even our, you know, our, our entertainment outlets. So you'll see mm -hmm. comedies or dramas and they, they just reinforce these pieces for us. Perfect segue to the next piece that we're going to be talking about, which is the ladder of inference. Um, and you said something uh, before this perfect segue, Nathan, you said something about, you know, wondering what people are going to assess about me just by looking at me. That's where this ladder of inference comes in. And this is one of the tools that you're going to find in the discussion guide, just to help your families that you're working with as a leader, help them understand how that works. So as you look, it, it, it describes that it's a reflexive loop. What happens is that we as human beings, you know, we look out into the world, we see something and whatever it is that we observe becomes a data set in our head, right? And it's based on that singular experience sometimes, but it still becomes that, that data set. That is our observation. From all of those observations and all of that data, we start to select that data that we think is most valid, that is most accurate. Once we select the data, then we start ascribing our own personal meanings to the data. And as I'm talking about this, I just want to I just want to help everybody understand. I'm going to give you some examples so that you can understand how this can work in real time. So you start putting your personal or your cultural lens on whatever it is that you have seen, whatever it is that you have collected as your data set. 
and you add meanings based on your cultural and experiential lens, your personal lens, which then cause you to make assumptions. So you go from you go from what you saw to the piece of it that you collect to the meaning that you ascribe to that piece of data that causes you then to make other assumptions that are built on those meanings that you have come up with on your own. And they in turn bring you to make conclusions and the conclusions um, in this ladder of inference are almost always generalized rather than specific to whatever you saw, right? And so that's how we start um, really going down that road of having biases and assumptions and, and really racist thoughts about other people. You then adopt beliefs about the world. So the beliefs, and this is the part that, that makes the loop happen, the beliefs that you adopt based on what you have seen cause you to then look at your data set and your observable experiences and pick out those things that are going to support your beliefs. We did a project a few years ago where we had some folks that work in um, the information in the media world who helped us understand that the first thing that you read or see oftentimes is the thing that you collect and you keep and and it and really dislodged our bill our actually our approach to trying to teach people by telling them about myths and then trying to disprove the myth because once we put the myth out there that's what got embraced right and the final thing that happens with all of this is that then in that ladder of inference, you're going to take actions based on the beliefs that you see. So what do we want to think about in all of this? We want to wonder, we want to ask ourselves, how do our assumptions that are coming from what we're observing and the meanings we are given to it view, affect how we view race and racism, right? We know that everybody has biases. It's just the way that it is. You believe things, you like things better than other things, that's even part of a bias. Our task as we're trying to become anti-racist group leaders, parents, human beings in the world is to figure out how to climb back down that ladder to see where we may have made a false assumption, where we may have applied a meaning that really isn't the accurate or the appropriate meaning. And using the ladder to go up and down can be really helpful. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you a sort of a, a story about what happened in this particular case. This is a real life example. And it is about one of my children who is African-American. Fifth grade, Justice, and Justice has given me permission to share this story. Justice had a teacher named Miss Lane who was the English teacher. And the observation that Miss Lane made about Justice was that this black child in the class was not at the level academically that, that she would have expected the child to be in the fifth grade. She also observed that this child was well-behaved, didn't cause trouble, and was definitely engaged in the class, even though what she was, what she was observing from this child was not um, accurate or, or um, correct according to the English curriculum that was being taught. The data that the teacher brought in to her own mind and then used to take action was that the child, Justice, continued to do C-level and lower work and never had any improvement in spite of being engaged. So the meaning that this teacher put on that was that black children are not very smart but they're also usually disruptive when they don't get it. And this particular black child has not been disruptive even though he doesn't get it. The assumption that Miss Lane met then came to was that in her world, in her belief system, it is genetically predisposed that justice could not do the work based on being African-American. And the conclusion was that this particular black child did not need further guidance because it wasn't gonna make any difference anyway. So 
Ms. Lane adopted these observations, data, meaning assumptions, conclusions, and then embraced a belief. I'm correct that this child and all black children aren't very bright, but the action that I'm going to take is that I'm gonna give this child a B on the report card as sort of a reward for not being a bad kid, just being a dumb kid. I'm gonna stop there for a minute. And I'm gonna ask um, that Emma goes to the next, si the next side. And so if folks could put into the box, the chat box, some of their thoughts about what this story is. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna tell you some of the responses that I have heard personally from people who believe that there was no, there was nothing racist happening in this. People that did believe it, it was kind of like just, I, that would never happen. I would never do that. I'm a teacher, that can't happen, it's not so. Other people, so are we supposed to assume that everyone has bad intentions? Is that what we're supposed to believe now, that everybody has bad intentions? And then many people said, what makes you think this is about race and not something else? Now think about it because Justice is a child that had been in foster care and adopted, um, at this point was not new to the school, but there, right, there could have been other things. Why is this, why Kim, do you think this is about race? And, and, and specifically I was asked, why are you making everything about race? Everything is not about race, right? Mm -hmm. And we oftentimes do get that pushback. I, I wonder you know, if, if other folks that are on this um, particular webinar have had that kind of pushback. Well, I'm gonna tell you, and I'm, I'm gonna share this with you so that you can then have some tools in your own toolbox to check with those feelings, right? So how can we check the, how can I check? How, how could my husband and I check? to make sure that we were right, that this was racism. First of all, we knew that we had to find out because we, we couldn't arm our kids, particularly our kids of color, for assuming the best in everybody all the time. Because when they're out in the world without us, if they're assuming the best of everybody all the time, they can be in danger, they can be very vulnerable, right? And we also needed to sort of sort through for ourselves as parents and then for our child and then further for the school system, how being a member of a particular cultural or racial group can lead us and other people to assume certain things and to take action on those assumptions. So here's what happens. We ask questions. Mm -hmm. Miss Lane, can you tell me what you mean? Ms. Lane, can you tell me why it is that Justice got a B on the report card when all the work that I saw was D, C? It doesn't add up for me. Can you tell me why you believe it was an okay thing to give my child a grade that wasn't the grade that he actually earned? And can you tell me how you think that is gonna help him to learn how to use grammar, punctuation, writing skills and all the rest of that to help him in his growth. And can you tell me how you arrived at the conclusions that you arrived at? These are all questions that help whoever it is that we are concerned with has jumped up that ladder of inference to really be able to look at themselves and to explore and to be able to hear another point of view. So I'm gonna tell you the rest of the story. We did ask all of those questions. And what Miss Lane answered was, well, I just find it so surprising that Justice thinks Jesse, who was our white birth son, that Justice thinks Jesse is his brother, just like Tanya is his sister. Tanya is also adopted and is Justice's biological sister. What do you mean by that, Miss Lane? Well, I mean, for goodness sake, Clearly, he's not his real brother. What does that have to do with anything? Well, you know, justice is different. 
well, how is justice different? Well, you saw his report card and you saw his papers. You told me that his papers didn't match the report card grade. Okay, again, Miss Lane, then why did you give him that grade? Well, because he's not a bad kid, you know? And then Miss Lane said, he's not like the other ones. Miss Lane, the other ones what? Well, you know what I mean. No, Miss Lane, I don't know what you mean. Well, I mean the other black kids. So you gave our, da our, you gave our son a B on his report card because he didn't come in threatening you and acting the way that you think black children do. Yes. This was in a very progressive town. This was in a school system that I would have thought it never could happen in. I'm looking at the chats. I agree with everything that you're saying that this is a definitely a racist experience. Here's the, here's the thing that um, I think we have to be aware of. These kinds of things happen all the time in schools for our kids, but we don't always pay attention and put together the pieces. And we don't always um, either have the ability to or the knowledge that we must push back and ask questions about it. As a parent, when we see our kid come home on the honor roll with all A's and B's, we're excited about that, right? Um, it, it did not happen in Minnesota, no. Um, we, we're excited, we see that report card, we wanna congratulate our child. But our other responsibility is also to make sure that our child's experience is equitable, that it is helping them get to be where they wanna be. So making the appointment to go in and talk to this teacher and challenge a good grade and say, I think that the child should have had a worse grade is a tough decision to make. But what was more important was to find out why it was that our son was being treated the way that he was in that school. And then how do we work either with the teacher or with the school system or with our son to make sure that the experience he was going to get would be the right one. Britt, I see you up there. Yes. And I have a question. It's a clarifying, I have a clarifying question. And then I have a, a question on, on how would this, how you would navigate this in a group setting. Um, okay. The first question is from Sally. And she was asking if we could say a little bit more about the myths example in relation to the ladder. Let me go back to the ladder. About the myths. And I might have waited too long to ask you that. <laughs> That's okay. I don't what that was so you mean in terms of the assumptions that, that we make? Right. Okay, right. So we, I mean, we do, we all swim in the same pool, like I said. So one of the myths that I know that I grew up with was the myth that black and brown men can be dangerous to white girls. That was my father's myth. It was a myth that he stated overtly and it was a myth that he made sure that I knew implicitly. Fortunately, I have always been suspicious of the ladder of inference. I think as a young kid, I've always sort of, really, why do you believe that? That's always been my stance, right? Mm -hmm. So I went back to my dad to talk about his myth and I got nowhere with that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did know even as a even as a young teenager, was that because I had heard that myth from him for so many years, that I could, if I wasn't very intentional about it, I could make that myth of his be my conclusion and my belief. Right, and that even if I'm not getting that same the ex same explicit information, that I still exist in this society and I'm still getting exactly. implicit information that informs that. Exactly. And that my impressions. Yeah. And then I can share like another, um, and this is really, for me, it's a very uh, widespread kind of a societal myth that I've seen change over time. But again, I, I'm 66 years old. So, and I can remember watching news shows way back when I think it's gotten marginally better, but not great. I will say, I don't think it's gotten a lot better. Growing up, in the, in the New England area, watching TV, watching news reports, I can remember specific incidents when people would be the on the street interview, right? 
Mm -hmm. And the reporter would talk, I'm sure before they came to what clips they use, the reporter probably talks to 20 people, 25 people, because they have to have enough to sort through to get some good sound bites. And I can remember and even had conversations um, with my family, with my kids, um, and with friends. Isn't it interesting that the white people that are getting interviewed and then shown on TV sound fairly articulate and they're talking about what is at hand. And the clips that I was seeing of brown and black people that had been interviewed were either they, it was either that they picked people that just didn't look like they had it all together or they said things that seemed off topic. Mm -hmm. um, Nathan, I'm seeing you shake your head. I think you're yeah, it's probably like skewed it based on like it it totally skewed. How and to so show. The image that we were getting as a society was if you want the facts, go to the white guy. And it was mostly the guy, not the woman. women. So there's also that piece as well. And so there's another myth that gets sort of planted in our heads because of things that we see on a routine basis, right? A, a game show or a talk show where the host says to a person of color, wow, that's an amazing answer. Mm -hmm. The myth behind that kind of a statement is we don't expect people that look like you to be able to have those kinds of answers. I right. hope that helps, Sally. I think so. And then the other question, um, when you are experiencing this kind of like resistance in a group setting, like when you're mm -hmm. in a support group and you're having this conversation and you're telling this a story or a similar mm -hmm. story and you're getting these like, well, how do you know it's about race or how you're making a mountain out of a molehill? How would you address that as the as the group leader? How would you navigate that? So I think as a group leader, you know, one of the things that Nathan and I have been working on in another project is thinking about coaching, right? And I think as a group leader, you're really going to help your families get where they need to be um, more quickly, but also in a way that's sustained when you can use more of a coaching approach. So if, pardon me, if I'm getting pushback, I don't know that I'm going to want to try to convince that person in the moment. What I'm going to want to do is I'm going to ask them some questions. Um, so can you share more with me about what you think it might have been? Mm -hmm. um, can you share more with me about some of the details before, during, and after? And then together, can we come up with some questions or some I'm wondering statements that you could bring back to that situation, right? So say... Uh, Joe in my group says, so this is a thing that happened, but I know it wasn't about race. And I might say, well, I wonder about that, Joe. It sounds like it could have been. No, no, no. You're seeing race and racism and everything. I can just tell. Okay, Joe. So can you tell me a little bit more about it? Do you have an opportunity to go back and revisit that conversation? And then here's some questions you might want to ask to help you decide whether it's about race because you've got some decisions to make on behalf of your family if it is. Mm -hmm. And some of those questions are the ones that I was talking about on this slide before. Ask that person who said or did whatever it is, can you tell me more about what you mean? Can you explain to me um, how you came to that belief? Huh, I wonder what you mean by that. Huh. I wonder why you said it that way. So those kind of curious questions and, and very much we want to ask them with a tone of curiosity because um, we, we both want to get to understanding, but also we need to know, especially in a, in a case where it's something that's happened in the community, we need to provide people with enough space um, and enough safety that they can tell us what really is on their mind so then as a parent who's coming to my group leader for, for help and advice, I can then help that parent make the right decision about what to do next on behalf of their child. And Nathan, let me turn it to you for anything additional. No, I, I agree with, with all of those pieces. And I, you know, add to just in like, how do you move forward with the next steps? Because I saw also in the comments, you know, like, what do you do? How do you respond if you encounter something like that? I think it's also in those questions 
And as group leaders, you know, talking within your group, how do you respond is also an important question. So what, what could happen, you know, pros and cons, if we address this going in guns a blazing versus just asking questions or it bringing in administrators. I saw in the comments, you know, someone saying that they felt like they wouldn't be believed if they told, you know, their school or administrative team that they experienced this with a teacher. And so mm -hmm. I think that's the other part that we, you know, as when we're in that group that we have to be able to strategize together and talk through either in that coaching way or using other lived experiences of how do we then approach this? You know, you learn it and that's one thing, but what do you do with it? Um, and when we're doing that, keeping in mind, how does this impact the child? You know, because sometimes, and I know we're going to get into privilege a little bit later, but sometimes we think, well, I'll just go in and I'll say exactly what needs to be said and demand justice, but we don't mm -hmm. think about the ramifications that it's going to have on the young person, and the young person might not want it um, delivered in that way. So I think we also have to um, be aware of that. I see we that just right. got our 30 minute time. Yeah, Let's go. <laughs> we're just making sure that we uh, can, can talk about these other pieces. All right. So defining identity. Um, and for time's sake, I'm actually going to jump through, like, instead of doing the activity, I'm going to talk about it because they'll have a, an opportunity to do it in the discuss or in the guide, if that's okay with you, Kim. Oh, pa uh, yes. Okay. So we obviously, as, as part of what you'll see in, in the guide, once you're reading through it, Talking about identity is a very important discussion for you to have within your group um, because it, it really does shape, again, how your young person develops. But then we have to think future planning, adulthood. And for a lot of people, um, I've heard you know mixed feelings from, from parents on, oh, my kid doesn't care about that or doesn't want to talk about it. Or you know is this something I need, even need to bring up? And always I tell, yes, start talking about it then because I, I will say 99% at some point in time in that young person's life, they are going to have an experience where it starts mattering to them, where it becomes something that they're like, oh yeah, I need to know more about that. And we want to have them prepared with some tools. So when we're talking about identity, it's very important that we're acknowledging all the various things that make us who we are. And so as you'll see with this, um, this example that we're, we're not going to go into detail on it, but the example that you'll be able to do and, and um, go off of in later sessions is about the identity example. Yep, so you can see the chart here. And so what we're doing here is having participants, you you within your group would put your name there and think about all the things that you put out to the world um, that show who you are and what you identify as and all the ways that you think the world um, shows that how they identify you. And so through this example, which we you know don't have an opportunity to, to do as a test with you all, but one of the interesting things that we have found in, in just our research and in our in practice is that oftentimes when you are white, it is you're not as likely to put white as any of the either pointing out or, or coming in pieces for your identity because it's all it's like the default. And so what we really encourage people as they're doing this activity to really think about how even that identification sets the tone for all the rest of these points that you will put in there. And oftentimes what we will see for people of color is that they will put their identification, their racial identification in there. And so even that creates a, a dialogue piece of experience and the worldview and how that shapes identity formation. So this is a really, it can be a really um, engaging conversation, a way to uh, again, break the tension, definitely set up that safe space again so that we can talk and have that honest conversation about did you put race? And even if you did, even if everyone put in there, you know, white, then that's a great opportunity to talk about, okay, so what experiences reinforce for you that white is an identification and that you need to be able to acknowledge that in order to move spaces. Um, and so I'm making sure I can read at the same time as talking. I'm not doing that that great. So. And in, in answer to your, your question, Britt, um, we were, you know, this other project that I was referring to that Nathan and I are working on, in a huge room full of people of all ages and all backgrounds, literally every single person of color. Um, they were indigenous people, Latinx people and African-American people. Every single one of them included that identity almost first. And almost every single one of the white people in the room didn't include it at all. And these were child welfare workers and advisors. Right. And I wonder too, so much, uh, I think a lot of white people, especially were taught to distance themselves from white right. identity. And we mm -hmm. do talk about that in the guide as well, um, about how important it is to um, make sure that we're understanding that 
ha- I have a racial identity and I have a white racial identity. And that doesn't mean that I'm aligned with white nationalism or white supremacy right. in that right. white identity. I, but because we conflate them all together. And then as a consequence, we don't, we, we throw all of it away. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that, that again, you know, even as we heard earlier about it, it being uncomfortable or you, you know, don't want to feel um, like you're being disrespectful or offending people using white can seem offensive to people because of how, you know, our society has been, especially again, over the last few years, as we go through these waves of resurgence about acknowledging race and racism in our, in our time. So it can be tricky. Like, do I put white? Is it going to be seen as bragging or, you know, I'm showing, I'm trying to show that I'm better than someone. And so that can also be a, a reason. So thank you for that, for that, Brett. Uh, and again, we have to acknowledge that racial identity work is a lifelong process. Um, we, as parents, there is a responsibility again to to open the door, and that's that's really the part that I get. I like to impart on people. There's this feeling as parents because there's so much you have to do in so few years before your child is out in the world, and so especially as we talk about the importance of race and racial identity, it can feel like you have to really like hammer it in for your kids. And beat them over the head until they understand their race and culture and fully embrace it before they turn 18. And that's not at all what I'm saying. Well, as parents, what I recommend is opening the door to the conversation, having them understand that you are a safe person that they can explore that with, that you have an understanding and foundation of both, you know, the problems and opportunities that come with navigating a transracial family. And that's really where that responsibility is. So that as they make that navigation, either in childhood or young adulthood or later on, they know the reference points of when you were involved and they feel like they can come back and talk to you. As I've talked to colleagues at various ages, um, one of the pieces that has impacted their ability to talk about race and racial identity is how their parents respond even in their adulthood to topics that come up. And so if news articles come out and as situations appear on social media, the responses that their family give impact the way that they bring up the topic or don't bring it up at all. And then they find their own group. And so as parents, that's what, we, and as you're leading these groups, that's the part we want to really stress within our groups is that responsibility to make sure that you are an open person that they can come to and know that you're going to be an advocate and listen and listen to them. And, and then again, finding those resources and strategies, not only for yourself and for your other parents, but also for your young people, helping them read things from other people with lived experience, um, getting a part of groups that uh, of people with lived experience who have navigated transracial adoption, um, transracial foster care, all of those pieces and how that impacts, again, young adulthood and on. Um, and as we go on to the next one, one of the pieces for this is also just making sure that we acknowledge that, you know, the whole family has to adjust and adapt. We often think of um, this process as the the young person, child of color, or, you know, just in adoption general as being the one that changes. But really in this whole process, what we're doing is acknowledging race and racism to understand how we all can, no matter, you know, what race we are, we all have to make some adjustments and be able to adapt to understand various cultures. Um, and so it should be a family process, not we do this with this one black or brown child, and then the rest of the time we do our own white thing. Uh, so that that's something to keep in mind. So this next piece, there is quite a bit in the discussion guide for you to talk about understanding white privilege, um, understanding how it plays out in your group and for your group members, how it plays out in their families and in their communities. It's really important that we find a space for our group members to be able to acknowledge that their privilege does exist because their privilege has actually opened doors for them in different places. Um, And some of the doors that it has opened for them, um, it opened also for their kids but only when their kids were in their presence, right? So I I do want you to know that there is gonna potentially be challenge in your group when we talk about privilege. Um, People often will talk about the fact that they didn't have money or they came from a poor part of town or they were, you know, the product of a, a, a single, they grew up in a single parent family or whatever it is. But what people who are white like me do have is they have the way that they look that oftentimes can bring us into a door in the first place that our kids may not be able to go in. And when I say into a door, it's a literal door and a figurative door. 
um, the fact that you had struggles, that matters, but you didn't have the additional struggle of being judged or have assumptions made about you based on the color of your skin and how you present at first glance. Um, and so it really goes very deep into that. And the other thing about it that I think is, is critically important for kids who are who, kids of color who are adopted by white families is that the other piece of their identity that is no longer up for grabs necessarily is that they've been in care or that they've been adopted, that they are not growing up with the family that they were born to, which then leads into all these other avalanche of assumptions about who they are, where they came from, the value of their family and their community. So definitely a piece that you're going to want to look into. Um, the next piece that happens, um, I'm going to encourage you guys to take a look at the video clip that we're not going to watch right now because um, we want to get to the we want to get to more of the conversation that Nathan is going to lead. But it is a video clip that does talk about what I alluded to, that idea that when your kids of color are with you, they have a bit of that white privilege that suddenly gets stripped when they are on their own. Something important also to think about. So we'll go to the culture. Yeah, there we go. And so, and yeah, we can just touch on what what you would have seen in the video. And it's exactly what Kim was saying is, you know, we have people with lived experience in the in that clip, and you'll be able to access it even in the guide who talk about that that white by osmosis. So feeling like, you know, you have a shield over you when you're with your family, and then as you go and experience the world outside of them, how that can impact and make things difficult or scary or challenging. Um, and so that's, you know, really important for us as you're all looking through this and thinking about how it's going to impact your conversations and, uh, and, and caring for your children, which also then again ties into the culture and, mm -hmm. um, you know, with racial identity. And so we, we often lump the two together, you know, we say race and culture. Um, and as you can see from this, you know, word bubble, we know that culture is a, a whole lot of things, you know, and so it includes, as you see, worldviews and music, traditions, um, shared history, all of those pieces are really important and shape it. And what you find is that there are, you know, cultures and subcultures and subcultures, and your family might even have its own culture, um, even within a broader context. And so we know that those pieces are really important and tie into racial identity, adoption identity, all of those other, um, again, cultures that the broader ones that we uh, connect to. Uh, so we can go to the, the next one. And, and why does, you know, why does it matter to, to look at race and look at culture and, you know, the white by osmosis and all of that. And this is something, you know, one of um, a person that we've been very connected with and has been connected to our NACAC for a long time once said this, that when you consider termination for a child, you need to consider all the reciprocal bonds, obligations, and relationships that it will affect. And I think that, you know, that's, again, super important. We, we often think is, again, it's an isolated incident. We're just plucking the kid out, and now they have a loving family and all good. But we really need to think about all of the connections that we bring, that even we bring to our lives, and that, again, children bring, and how we're going to make sure that we are um, keeping those intact as much as possible. And I know that, that people have a variety of reasons why they get apprehensive about navigating and maintaining some of those relationships. And there's, of course, other guides and stuff that you can look at on that. But we need to first think about how to keep people in versus taking people out. Um, that's mm -hmm. the, the gist of all of this, because when we're eight, we, we as people and you all as parents, you know, it can feel like you have to do everything. And what we want to get across is that you can't. You can't do everything. You can't be everything through this journey for your kid. And you shouldn't be. Um, so helping them connect to other people, to other reference points is going to be super impactful for that long-term development. And it's why we have to have these conversations so that when they get out in the world and they might stumble or they might encounter difficulty, that they know that they have tools and resources in addition to you all as parents that they can connect to to help sort it all out. Um, and then finally, for for me, it's, you know, helping, one of the things that we have to do is help group members work towards cultural adaptation. And so the ability for us to be able to, and I'll say, 
you simplifying it, being able to understand the complex facets that, that make up culture, but being able to navigate those without having to insert our culture and be dominant, you know? And so then that, that's, again, because we're mostly talking for white parents, um, parenting transracially for children of color, it can feel difficult to go into a, another culture or be surrounded by a culture that's not the one that you're familiar with and just being okay and being able to adapt and navigate. Um, I remember even for myself as a teen, you know, I went to, uh, I had a competition and my mom, who, my adoptive mom, who's white, was in this church where it was all black people. And so th the competition was for this black led church. And she would, you know, was telling me after her, she was like, oh, this is the first time I have not been in a situation where I'm the sole, you know, minority white person in the room. And so she felt like she couldn't say anything. She didn't want to embarrass me and all those things. And so we have to be able to, you know, work towards all of us are working towards how do we how do we come into other cultures with the sense of being able to take them in, honor them um, without feeling like we have to, as you see, like tokenize them or things like that, um, or we're just using, you know, pieces because it seems fun or cool or, oh, I hear that this is, you know, really popular right now. Um, so all those pieces are, are really important. Kim, I don't know if you, do you want to say anything to that? I uh, actually, I put something in the chat box just now. Um... That whole piece around having cultural guides, we were so fortunate that our kids had a grandmother, um, three moms, and two dads, African American friends of ours, um, you know, fictive kin for us, who were part of our family constellation and provided a lot of the guidance and a lot of, you know, sort of even the sounding board for our kids that as white parents, neither their dad nor I could provide. Um, we also were very fortunate that, that although all of our adoptions had been closed um, when we came forward and started the process, we were able to open all of the adoptions up with the extended family members and birth parents so that our kids um, had more family rather than less, right? It wasn't a this or that. So just some of the closing thoughts. Um, first of all, these are really hard conversations for a lot of us, right? Uh, you know, Nathan and I check in with each other, who should say it, how should they say it? I've been asked for many, many years to come and speak on these topics. I never will do it without a partner, a partner of color who um, and can bring another perspective. Um, and I've been having the conversations really since before our children ever entered our family. And I know that I still can get really emotional about it, sometimes on their behalf, sometimes on behalf of the whole world, and just sometimes because I don't know what else to do. And I'm a person who wants to have the conversation. So, right, you need to know that it is going to be tough. And you need to give people permission and sort of uh, um, an expectation that it's going to be tough. It it's going to be, there may be tears. There's gonna be feelings of regret. That's okay, we're in this together. We're in here to help one another. We really have to check in as, as Nathan started the conversation. And also I know Britt referred to this as well. Whoever, whatever members of your group are black, indigenous or other people of color, check in with them even prior to having the discussions. What role would you like to play? What role wouldn't you like to play? What advice do you have for me? Can we have some kind of a signal so that I know if you are feeling like you're being put on the spot or you're being looked at as the expert? I heard about this sort of that expertise when Justice was in the fifth grade and he came home from one of his classes. It was the Civil War history lesson. And he said, mom, I cannot believe everybody in the class, every time they talk about slaves, they turn to me like I know something about it. Right. And, and that's such a typical thing for being put on the spot in that way. So we really want to think about that. Um, we've said this again and again, but we can't say it too many times. These are not one-time conversations. These are conversations that are ongoing. Um, and they're oftentimes conversations that you might want once you've got your feet on the ground under you around this with your group, infuse them in some of the other discussions that you have around other things, right? Around, you know, where are your kids developmentally? Um, what's happening academically? How are we thinking about transitioning to adulthood? 
These conversations are important in every single aspect of your child's life. And finally, really make sure that you and your group have engaged in trust building exercises, um, in some deep conversations about things that really matter to them. Make sure that the folks that are in the room can be counted on to have one another's back as they go on this journey. Nathan, anything else we need to tell them to remember? No, uh, and again, I know we you know try to hit some highlights from the guide, but that's you know that is what this is. We knew when we started putting this together, there was so much more content we wanted to be able to cover, but we're like we you know we don't have the time, and that's exactly why we're saying you know this is something that's going to take time to digest. So we wanted to be able to provide those highlights, and I think you know that that's it. Got a taste of it, and we hope that 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 you know gets you all eager for being able to really dive deep into the guide later yeah, on and join exactly. us for your support later. Yeah. That is, that's mm -hmm. such an excellent segue, Nathan. Um, exactly. This is the beginning of the conversation. The guide will help you with the conversation. And we do hope that you'll come to the peer meeting and kind of thinking of this as kind of like a continuum for all of us of like, let's continue. And, and also the peer meeting is an opportunity for us to really dig into what your specific um, challenges are or successes are and for peers to share amongst each other in a way that, you know, where me and Kim and Nathan can only do so much while we're talking at you. Um, uh, I have, uh, there's a question. Uh, for both of you um, uh, around um, for those that are child welfare professionals that are leading groups. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Kim, you and I um, often talk about how, um, the, you know, the um, importance of these being conversations that are led by people with lived experience, especially if you're talking to white parents with children of color, you really want that person like you who has parented children of color to be able to share, oh, you know, what my experiences were like, and I had this happen, and here's how I handled this at the school, here's how I handled this. Um, if you're a professional who's kind of tasked with this group, what advice do you have um, to make sure that you aren't um, overstepping uh, with people with lived experience um, and that you are you know, making sure that you're bringing um, the most relevant and useful information to your group um, while still kind of maintaining the space and maintaining the facilitation, keeping the ball moving? So hopefully um, you've got if you don't have a co-facilitator for your group, hopefully you at least have back backup that you know that you can count on when you need to. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, as we said from the beginning, this isn't a conversation that you're going to have at jump with your new group. These yeah. are conversations you're going to have once you get to know your group. And I think it's going to be really important for leaders to engage somebody else in the group to help facilitate the conversation. Um, people, you know, maybe bring in a guest speaker, um, maybe do some book club reading together to talk through these things. Um, there's just a whole lot of ways that you can make it come to life. But I will say that if you are a professional leading the discussion and you don't have lived experience as a parent and or you don't have lived experience in this transracial, multiracial family configuration, I really strongly advise you to find an ally that will help do the work with you. Even if they're not leading the group with you, who would be, who would be willing to share some of their experiences, some of their strategies, um, it would really be helpful. Awesome. Um, another question related to that, how can I check to be sure that I, I really am ready? to lead a group um, in this discussion? How can we make sure that our groups are ready and that I'm ready as a facilitator? And I, and I think we have, you know, a little more of that, more detail in the guide of, you know, some of those check steps. But one of the things you, you wanna do as we talked about in the beginning is really understanding what your knowledge is of this topic. I think that's one of the best places is what do you know? What do you feel like you know? What can you learn before you bring this to the group? And it's okay to learn with your group, but you want to have a certain amount of foundational knowledge before you try to lead others through it, mm -hmm. because inevitably there will be questions or, or you know, roadblocks that you encounter, and you're going to want to have something to, to go back on. The other thing you're going to want to do is assess how comfortable am I navigating the topic? I can know things, but talking about it is completely yeah. different. Totally. The first time someone tells me, no, I don't think, I think you're just seeing race. Am I really in a spot where I'm prepared to answer it without going, 
to 10, you know, because it's not yes. the, because I, I always hear people, oh, I don't mind. I'll tell people how it is. That's not as helpful either. And so are you in a level enough space that you can approach a very um, hard and complicated topic in a way that keeps people in a place mm -hmm. of saying, oh, wow, yep, I didn't think about that or I need to do my own checking, you know, so there's that emotional check. And the other piece I would assess is who are your debrief aftermath people because sometimes mm -hmm. you can get through it and with your group you want to show that you're a strong leader you know but at the end you're like oh my gosh I'm exhausted that hit something for me that I didn't know mm -hmm. who are you going to talk to that's going to help you navigate that piece that is, um, and so that I, I think that those, are, <laughs> those are some really good ways that I would start um, before I do uh, dove into you know leading a group through this and I'll add one bottom line thing if you haven't had a hard conversation yourself with anybody around this topic, you're not ready to do it in a group. Right. right? You yeah. need to have been in the midst of really trying to navigate the conversation personally. Mm -hmm. That's what's so hard, I think, about this in general is you know that the, we need to move, move the needle forward, but there's personal work as yeah. well as parenting work, as well as group work. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a lot. So I, I appreciate both of you, first of all, for lending your um, personal and professional experience to this, um, both to this webinar and the guide and to our peer meeting that we're going to have. Um, I'm going to ask Mary to put the link to the peer meeting in one more time, um, because I do want to make sure that folks are continuing the conversation with us. We would love to have you back. Um, uh, again, peer meeting, um, that link to that is in the um, coming in the chat. Um, I do want to make sure um, as we close out here that folks know um, that uh, I put the discussion guide itself that we've been alluding to several times in the chat. Uh, there are many, many resources for parent group leaders um, on um, that we've produced for Adopt US Kids under the Adopt US Kids banner. And all of these resources are free. So this is not a sales pitch. It's just if you have a need um, and you're a parent group leader, um, uh, we, we have resources for you. We have resources on how to facilitate virtual groups and how to um, how to navigate group dynamics, all sorts of stuff, other discussion guides like this. We have another one on the impact of trauma on behavior. So um, uh, we have actually an entire five module parent group leadership curriculum for new parent group leaders. Um, so if your agency runs parent groups and you need something that helps you train people to be ready to do um, complex conversations like this one, um, the uh, we have an entire curriculum uh, dedicated to that. Um, so as we as we close out here, I'm going to leave you guys with my contact information. Um, I will get you to Kim and Nathan because I, I imagine that's what folks are going to want. Um, but please reach out to me if you have um, comments, questions, concerns. Um, and uh, you can also reach out to consultation at adoptuskids.org to discuss how adoptuskids kids might be able to help your state, territory, or tribe with capacity building. Um, and we also, you, again, a very brief reminder, you're going to be getting an email from Adoptuous Kids Evaluation. Please take five minutes. We really, really appreciate your feedback back. Um, and with that, y'all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you for spending your Wednesday afternoon with us. Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks.